Would you pray with me? Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word, and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today I will be reading from Jeremiah 23, sections 1 through 8, and page 725. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord, that I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back into their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety, and this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Therefore, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought the people of Israel up out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought out and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the land of the north and out of all the lands where he had driven them, then they shall live in their own land. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> Chapter 13, verses 31 through 35, you can find it on page 77 of your New Testaments. And at that very same hour, some Pharisees came to him and said, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will finish my work. Yet today and tomorrow and the next day, I will be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together like a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will see me, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of God. I pray that you be with the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, that you would gather us under your wings today and comfort us, encourage us, and strengthen us. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to try to do this. Sit still. That's what I mean. <laughs> um, I made the commitment that I would sit if I came back after two weeks after surgery. So I'm going to do my best. But I don't think I've ever preached not pacing in years. So we're going to treat this kind of like coffee with rose. <laughs> um, so this morning, the, uh, the, the Luke passage starts off with this conversation. 
conversation about Herod. Now, you may be thinking we're talking about Herod that tried to have Jesus killed as a baby. Who thought that? I know. You did? That's okay. Yeah. So, this is actually that Herod's son, okay, to whom the, the passage is referring. And what's happening is young Herod, so, is, is not actually a king. He's kind of like, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? He's like a, like a, a government person kind of by proxy. Okay? Where Jesus is in the country is under Roman rule. And Herod has, this Herod that it's talking about, has dic dictatorship kind of over some regions. But not the region currently where Jesus is speaking when this passage happens. So someone, so it's kind of like what Jesus' response is kind of like, I don't really care. Do you, do you, do you see that? He's like, this is, this is what you're bothering me with? Well, then go tell him I'm here, and we'll see if he shows up. It's kind of the, the connotation of Jesus' comment. Because the reality is, he won't show up because he doesn't have authority in the place where Jesus is. First, does not have authority in, in the actual Roman city where Jesus is. Secondly, Jesus is saying, he's not going to be the one to kill me. Do you see that? Jesus is starting, in, especially in Luke, to, to point towards Jerusalem, towards the cross, and everything that he's going to say from this point forward in the Gospels start to point to his own death in Jerusalem. There's a whole bunch of parables that precede this passage that are all about redemption, the redemption of people in one form or another. Redemption of society, redemption of individuals. And, and then Jesus makes this comment about Jerusalem being the place where prophets die. Yeah? Okay, with me? Okay. So he's probably referring to Isaiah, we think. It's not in our scriptures, in the Old Testament, in, in our canon, that, that Isaiah was killed in Jerusalem. But it's common Jewish belief and it's in the Jewish writings that Isaiah was killed in Jerusalem, actually cut in half and thrown into the streets. Because that's how we treat prophets. What else do we do to prophets? We stone them. Huh? Behead them. We put them on a cross. Prophets are not treated well, especially in Jerusalem. So Jesus knows, even, even if, and there, there's, a, there's a section of Christians that think, or even Jews, right, that think that Jesus was just a prophet. You heard this? Or he was a good man. Even if that's so, this good man prophet knows what's coming for him in Jerusalem. That, that's what this whole conversation is about. I'm not bothered with this Herod guy who has no authority over me and my place where I am. But what I am bothered with is Israel and Jerusalem. And yet he's going for their redemption. All of these things, he's just had all these conversations about redemption. And that's why he's going to Jerusalem. 
for their redemption, for our redemption, for all of it. And then there's this beautiful, beautiful image. This is a this is one of the mothering images of God in Scripture. So if you see God as a uh, man sitting on a throne with a beard, who's white. Um, this this is one of those not not one of those images that I find so beautiful and when they come out of the pages of scripture I want to lift them up to you this is a description of God or Jesus as a mother hen it's beautiful redemption and caring comes as a mothering hen who who's, we, puts out her wings and scoops her babies up underneath her. Isn't that lovely? I really like that image of God. And in a time when, when, you, when you're scared, when you're a mama bear who's scared, everybody, anybody mama's been scared for your babies? Mine's two and a half right now. She's fearless. I get really scared. And, but, but even when you're frightened, so even if Jesus is frightened, which we don't know that he is or is not, I would imagine a human Jesus referring to being a prophet going into Jerusalem is a little scared, but still offers the image of bringing up under his wings. He's lovely. And that, paired with this description of leadership that we get in Jeremiah. I can't not mention what happened this weekend. It would be unfaithful of me to not talk about New Zealand. And that we, we are talking about all of God's people being brought in and loved and mothered and warmed underneath the wings of God. In stark contrast with a description about leaders who cause fear and scatter sheep. Every leader, especially religious leaders, has a responsibility to their flock. And a responsibility to teach warmth and love and grace. And so I want to tell you that I personally reject Islamophobia and that it is not a Christian act to go into any temple and hurt people while they are trying to faithfully worship. I have to say that as clear as I possibly can as your religious leader. I believe that we are called to welcome and love and all of those that are in the flock, whether you think they're in our flock or not. This, this, this story of Jerusalem, or of, of the, sh the shepherd, bringing, you know, they're scattering these leaders that are, not, this is in Jeremiah, I've jumped now. In Jeremiah, the leaders are, are the people are running away afraid, super afraid. Because the leaders have thrown the people to the powers, over taxes, by the way. So what's happened is that uh, in, in Jeremiah, what's happening is this is really hard for me not to be pacing. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it helps me think. Um, what's happening is that the leaders from the from the greater power above over the people where Jeremiah is, the governing body. 
wants taxes for Judah. And the religious leaders in Judah decide they're not going to pay the taxes. Thus, the people get taken into exile. Okay? It was a decision to not follow that, that, that authority, but they threw their people under the bus, essentially. The religious leaders took the people of Judea and threw them to the wolves. That's what's happening when we hear about scattering the flock. If, you, if I, as your leader, sold you, would you be pretty upset and a little anti-church? Even if it was just I, as your leader? Yeah? yeah. We've talked about this before. If, if, if the leader of a church, especially a leader of a church, does something that is abominable, that, that looks poorly on <clears throat> God, not on the leader. Do you, you get what I'm saying? Similarly, that happens with Christianity around the world. When someone does something horrible in the name of Jesus Christ, that looks bad on Jesus. Not, not on the disturbed human being who, did, who does the thing. Whatever the thing is. Whether that's kicking puppies. <laughs> Kelly, it's okay. Nobody kicked a puppy. <laughs> I'm just, I'm trying to, it's just an example. Okay. No puppies were hurt in the cause of this, in the writing of this sermon. Okay. Um, but, I mean, from, from little things, even though that's not a little thing, but from, from small acts of aggression all the way to large acts of aggression, like, like the shooting, like terrorism. But all, all the way from little little acts to have you heard the story of somebody they got all these Christian bumper stickers on the back of their car? You know, Jesus loves you, and um, I don't know what, what would Jesus do, and all this stuff. But they're driving like a maniac and flipping people off. <laughs> so the cop pulls them over because clearly the car's been stolen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? <laughs> it's that concept. Which does apply, I mean, it goes from this Jeremiah passage all the way down to individuals. We, we do have this responsibility when, when people know us to be Christians. What's that song? They will know we are Christians by our love. And so as you go into this week, I want you to kind of balance these two things. What's my responsibility as a Christian and a leader? Whether it be a leader of a community, leader of a church, leader of a small group, as a leader amongst your friends, What's my responsibility in caring and bringing people in? And then how, the other end of that is, how do, what are the places in which I need to be brought in by God? I think we, we have these places where we are in need of redemption in our lives. Whether that's through fear, through concern. And the purpose of Lent is that we bring ourselves under the care of God as we prepare for God to save us. And so let us 
think about the places in which we do want to be redeemed. I promise you, you don't do it right all the time. I don't do it right all the time. We make mistakes, and that's okay. But the point is that we come before God and are willing to be scooped up 